so um, please let, I want to thank Matt Taylor for setting up this occasion. Um, I also want to thank Frank Grady, Grady for his leadership and what became part of the backstory for this talk. Uh, and I want to thank these four people uh, that you're looking at now, among others. And let me interrupt myself and say, if there's any problems with the uh, unfolding of the slideshow or with my transmission, if you'd let Tiffany or Peggy know, um, they, can, uh, they can alert me, okay? So the top two students here are excellent graduate students at um, Amzil, Chelsea Brooks, and Jason Dulworth. And the bottom two are Wash U students, Jonathan Koch, who's actually got his PhD last spring and is now on a postdoc at the Clark Library at UCLA, and Kate Needham, who was a Wash U undergraduate and worked with me and my colleagues in the Humanities Digital Workshop prior to heading off to graduate work at Yale. I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to present some thoughts about new opportunities in our pedagogical arrangements. Uh, our meaning all of us engaged in um, education in the humanities. But I can't help feeling that I should say that Chelsea and Jason or John and Kate or all four of them should probably be giving this talk. Um, since in many ways it's about them, they're, and they're the perfect examples of what I'm trying to promote today. I think if I were to put my finger on the scales, I'd probably ask Kate to do the honors, but only because I've known her the longest. She wrote a wonderful thesis as an undergraduate, and that was hardly her first foray into serious scholarly work. By the time she graduated, she'd been working for a couple of years on the Spencer Project, a multi-institutional effort to edit the complete works of Edmund Spencer. And she'd also started working on early print, an effort to provide an accurate, richly usable corpus of printed English. She'd done purposeful, purposeful consequential work at several rare book repositories. She'd done a fair bit of web design and redesign. She participated in the preparation of major grant applications, and she demonstrated startling gifts as a project manager, this all as an undergraduate. Now, I can't take any credit for her unusual aptitudes, but I want to insist that had I been going about my professorial business differently, I wouldn't have had the occasion to discover, to discover those gifts, nor would I have been in the position to help her exercise and develop them. While this presentation is going to be strongly skewed towards digital humanities, DH is really a kind of cover story. For my central theme is project-based education in the humanities, and my chief evidence for its utility is Ms. Needham. But enough about her, let's talk about me. I was edged into work in digital humanities in two phases, shaped by two overlapping projects. Uh, Matt told you that I'd written my first book on Ben Johnson's court entertainments and then two books on the early English book trade, the development of intellectual property and the place of authorship in that development. After that, I was thinking of writing a book on um, early modern blindness or a book on the second half of Edmund Spencer's epic poem, The Fairy Queen. But then two old friends, David Miller and Patrick Cheney, recruited me to work on a Spencer edition for Oxford under the mistaken impression that because I knew something about book history and was editing a play for the Cambridge Ben Jonson, I could help them significantly with the text critical aspect of the edition. I didn't seem to be able to explain what was wrong with their assumption. So once I persuaded them to add Elizabeth Fowler to the editorial team, I agreed to edit my share of the corpus and to take on general responsibility for our textual policy. I told them that this edition should be born digital, that we should regard the print edition as a derivative subset of a digital archive, which should contain a good deal more than a traditional edition. It should have expanded commentary, 
a much richer archive of textual variation with scans of as many early copies as we could acquire so that people could check our work and in the future advance it. This was over a dozen years ago and I didn't really know what I was talking about when I spoke of a born digital edition. But these were the early days of NEH sponsorship for so-called digital scholarship and one could be rewarded for uninformed but high-hearted imagination. Anyway, it wasn't long before we we got into a tussle over editorial policy. And this will be a little technical for a minute. This extract comes from the correspondence between Edmund Spencer and Gabriel Harvey, which will be published in volume one of the edition. It evidences my first editorial efforts in which I made a few minimal departures from the printed book that was our copy text. We were, of course, normalizing long s, as it appears in early printed books, and the rendering of w as two paired v's, and uh, I had also started innocently expanding abbreviations, like ampersand in the middle of the page, and ye for the, and yt for that, and you can see the the changes that we were introducing. This is the edited version. These are trivial. Anyway, um, no one objected to these interventions, which simply effaced a, large, a largely contentless archaism of presentation. But it got, my thinking, got me thinking into where to draw the line. There's a long tradition of modernizing at least some of the spelling of early modern texts. Spelling sovereign, have, and, the, and love with v's and not u's, and spelling majesty with, and justice with j's and not i's. I thought we should do that with Spencer. But because he's known to be an archaizing poet, because his first book, The Shepherd's Calendar, and his epic, The Fairy Queen, are not only deeply indebted to Chaucer, Gower, Lydgate, and Skelton, medieval poets writing at least uh, almost two centuries before him, because he occasionally indulges in an early modern faux medievalism, an editorial tradition has developed in which all the archaic features, including his spelling, are meticulously preserved. To me, this seemed, frankly, bonkers. And I convinced David and Patrick to go along with some moderate normalizations. Our goal in following the established norms of non-Spencerian editorial practice was to reduce what we took to be an accidental wash of archaism in order to throw into relief those aspects of Spencer's language that would have been distinctive and idiosyncratic for the contemporary Elizabethan reader. Still, our, our fourth editor, Elizabeth Fowler, wasn't happy about our decision. And we added a fifth editor, and he wasn't happy about it either. Um, but they went along with it, but quite, quite grudgingly. On many occasions, they would reassert their allegiance to Spencerian editorial tradition. That's my picture of them um, <clears throat> pledging their allegiance to Spencerian editorial tradition. But it was three to two, and we continued to press forward semi-amiably. I never accused them of excessive conservatism, nor of unexamined deference to the editorial traditions of a disciplinary subfield. Why rub it in, after all? We had them three to two. We had them three to two, but the press got wind of our internal disagreement, and they sent our editorial guidelines out for review. And the single figure whom they consulted sided with the idolaters, and that was that. No hard feelings, ostensibly. There was, after all, a good deal of work to be done, no matter what spelling conventions we adopted. 
So I should say that the Spencer edition is headquartered at Washington University and it's very much a team effort. During most semesters, I worked with a I work with a graduate RA, one or two undergraduates, and the two programmers slash data scientists who make up the current staff of the Humanities Digital Workshop. The HDW runs an eight week workshop every summer, assembling larger teams to work on eight to 10 faculty projects drawn from across the humanities and interpretive social sciences. And in most summers, the Spencer team often expands to include a couple of other students. Student involvement on the Spencer project and the other faculty projects supported by the HTW has fostered some demand for more general courses in digital humanities. And we now have a minor and a graduate certificate that features courses in data management, programming for text analysis and statistics, all keyed to problems specific to research in the humanities. Note that both the minor and the certificate entail a substantial component of project work. Staffing some of these courses was a stretch, but happily one of the alumni at Washington University had recently endowed a couple of postdocs in the humanities. So we proposed a DH appointment and we got very, very, very lucky. We ran a national search and recruited Anupam Basu, who is also an early modernist. He had trained with Mike Whitmore, now the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Mike is at the forefront of DH work on Shakespeare, but he'd be the first to admit that most of his work prior to going to the Folger would be absolutely nowhere without Anupam's energy, imagination, or skills. And by the way, um, please pay attention to the other two figures in this photo. We'll get, I'll get back to them later. Much of Mike Whitmore's work involves the computational analysis of the corpus of early English drama as it is represented in the print record. As your students, Chelsea and Jason will tell you, a partnership of ProQuest, the University of Michigan, and a consortium of research libraries have transcribed roughly half of all the books printed in English between 1473 and 1700. And because so many of the books printed in that period are second and third editions, it's fair to say that this corpus, EBO TCP, gives us digital access to effectively the entire corpus of English printed discourse. To be clear, the dark bars in the foreground are the text transcribed in EBO TCP, while the gray bars in the background represent the total output of the English press from its inception to the turn of the 18th century. So EBO, EBO TCP represents, um, uh, actually we should redo that graph. It looks like it's 40%, but it actually represents more like 55%. And since, most of the others are duplicates and second editions. It basically is better than a sample. It's, it really captures virtually every new book printed between 1473 and 1700. Still, the corpus of Tudor and Stuart printed drama is numbered in the low hundreds. And Anupam had larger ambitions, larger ambitions than Mike Whitmore needed, ambitions that we were fortunately able to unleash. With the help of the staff of the HDW, Anupam set out to make the entire corpus of early print computationally tractable. This is a plot here of the annual number of words per book between 1473 and 1700. And you should know that the y-axis is plotted on a log scale um, just to make the graph more legible. Now, EBO itself provides a remarkable foundation for work in the history of the language. There's my search for remarkable, which produces 30,722 hits across all the records. It richly augments the Oxford English Dictionary, which had long provided the reference standard for the history of the language in print. Before we had EBO TCP at the top of that screen, there was no easy way of knowing that Remarkable was not first used in English in 1593, which is what the OED tells us. 
Anupam enables us to go Evo one better. I've taken this plot of the use of remarkable across the uh, across the history of um, uh, English printed, printing from 1473 to 1700. And note that the plot is total instances of use per year divided by the total number of words per annum. So it corrects for the remarkable increase in the total output of the press over the period. That is, it says that, that remarkable undergoes a remarkable increase of use independent of the increase in the number of sheer number of printed words over the period. To my mind, plots like these substantially enrich our field for the vagaries of discursive history. By the way, as I start putting up the data plots, please stop me if you need me to slow down so that you can soak stuff up. Uh, you can probably just dimly see the blip here around 1600 and then the takeoff in 1624. And from then on, you know, it's really off to the races for the usage and the interest in the, in the word and the idea of, of slavery. Of course, such visualizations of the Igbo TCP data raise as many questions as they answer. Why is there a, why is there such a bounce in the thinking about matter in 1580? In, in the late 1570s, early 1580s, why does it drop down? Why does it pop? Uh, wh why does it drop down until about 1640 and pick up again? Um, but for most of us, um, and so the questions that arise are a, a, a boon, um, and they're questions that we didn't have before. What's especially valuable about the resources that Onapam started developing for early print is that he took advantage not only of the data provided by the TCP consortium, but also the extraordinary supplementary linguistic work of a team of, at Northwestern, working under the leadership of Martin Mulo, a scholar of comparative literature who's long been one of the leaders in the field of digital humanities. Miller's team had harnessed some of the best work in natural language processing and had succeeded in regularizing the spelling of the TCP corpus so that you can find, um, you can find whether love is spelled uh, or whether, um, let's say, um, near is spelled N-E-A-R or spelled N-E-R-E. Um, and you can, you can search for it as N-E-A-R under a nor uh, as a as a regularized search, he's lemmatized every one of the 1.65 billion words so that <clears throat> you can find in a single search both hazards and hazard singular, um, and he's tagged them each each of them by part of speech, so that we can look for hazard as here and to hazard separately, hazard as a noun and hazard as an infinitive. This gets us closer to computationally assisted semantic history, to the history of concepts. At the same time, the linguistic encoding enhances our abilities to think about the history of forms, the history of rhetoric. So here we're searching for patterns that match to be or not to be, to keep or not to keep, to yield or not to yield, to um, uh, to do or not to do, and so forth. Here's a closer look of what we can do now. Every literary, and, and you can see that this breaks uh, to do or not to do down into its constituent parts of speech. It regularizes the spelling. It lemmatizes. Um, it really it 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 takes the it takes the text string um, in the original and makes it accessible to a whole range of conceivable kinds of um, inquiry. Every literary scholar should have access to such a corpus. Not just a heterogeneous set of decently accessible texts, but a corpus, easily accessible and quite homogeneous. The problem at this stage is that the corpus isn't good enough. The part of speech tagging isn't perfect. The scans on which the transcriptions are based derived from microfilms produced during World War II 
And for that and for other reasons, the transcriptions are imperfect. Kate Needham and I um, uh, set out on visiting campuses, um, uh, Anupam and, uh, and Kate as well, in hopes that we could recruit students to help us. First, by helping us improve the transcriptions, and later by helping us to improve the questions we ask of the corpus and the techniques by which we seek to answer them. When I say that everyone needs such a corpus, I'm happy to report that in most fields of English and American literature, we're getting pretty close. And such corpora are useful for those whose interests are more tightly focused than those of the cultural historian or even the historian of forms. Even the narrow-minded editor, like myself, has things to gain from such a resource. Happily, Anupam took note of my frustrated editorial struggles with the other struggles with the other Spencer editors, and began to brood not just on the history of forms and concepts, but on the history of spelling. So here we're tracking the rise and fall of spelling king with an I, and uh, the rise of spelling king with an I, and the fall of spelling over the Y. The, um, the rise of spelling claim with a final, uh, with an I, um, and of spell the fall of spelling it with a Y. Not all I and Y spellings, you'll note, sort themselves out at the same time. Also, most final E spellings, um, on the other hand, um, disappear at roughly the same time. So, um, grow with an E drops away, at roughly the same time that um, the finally in send drops away. The passages to the prevailing modern form were, are slightly asynchronous, but, and moreover, as you can see here, they sometimes entail reverses. It turns out that the complexity of the data is quite considerable, but for Anupam, this was simply a challenge. He offered to help me test my hunch about Spencer, my hypothesis that although Spencer's words, his lexicon, and even his syntax might entail a number of archaisms, his spelling was not itself idiosyncratic and did not therefore re recommend itself as an object of editorial veneration. Now this is a tough needle to thread. The same word, like kind, gets spelled variously in virtually all surviving early modern printed books of any length. And the same can be said of virtually all surviving manuscripts of the period. That is within a single printed book, you can find the same word spelled two, three, sometimes four different ways. The printed text of Spencer witnessed plenty of such variability. My own intuition, therefore, had to be framed as follows, that the variability in the spelling of Spencer's printed books was no greater or lesser than that of contemporary printed books, that his orthographic norms and variations do not vary significantly from the orthographic norms and variations of contemporary books, which were themselves in the midst of a very complex historical flux. We first needed to see if we could in fact model the history of English spelling, confirming that the schooling of letters into orthographic clustered, clusters exhibited a set of orderly and eventually coherent structures. Now I find this an especially difficult plot to read, not just because the subtending math is difficult, but also because the temporal dimension is plotted in color, with the earliest orthographic clusters displayed in red and the late clusters displayed in yellow. The key takeaway for our purposes is the coherence of the plot. If you care, I can explain the central yellow plume during the, this one, during the question period. Um, Anupam broke English spelling into thousands of three character sequences and discovered, that is, he took every word and space 
and broke it into a sequence of either three letters or, uh, or two characters and a space, variously arrayed. And um, we then sought the 200 most significantly variant sequences, the ones that actually changed the most using standard statistical models, which treat each of those sequences or what, what are called features as occupants of each of 200 dimensions, we proceeded to reduce the dimensionality of the data. The result is that we came up with a model of densities of change over time, sufficient to enable us to plot whether any given chunk of text might seem orthographically odd at any given moment. That is, we, we basically cut everything, every printed text into 1,000 word chunks. And we looked for the ones that seemed not to fit their, um, their environs. Uh, the other texts of the, uh, of, of the sliding window, temporal window in which they appeared. Anyway, here's the payoff. Chunks of Spencer's 1579 Shepherd's calendar are in the first red string of dots. The first installment of the Fairy Queen published in 1590 is the central string. And a bit further to the right, the string of dots representing chunks of the second 1596 installment of the Fairy Queen. The point is that all lies solidly within the gray band, marking the standard deviation of spelling over time. Here's another way to see this data. Um, these are, uh, this is all of Spencer's prose broken into three chunks and all of Spencer's verse broken into three chunks measured against um, contemporary, uh, chunks of contemporary um, text by other people. You'll note that the orthography of Spencer's verse is quite normal if we plot it against the spelling in other contemporary books. If anything is at all weird, it's the spelling of his prose and the prose involves no archaizing efforts. As you can see, and, and, and none of this would have been possible without the, um, um, without the EBO TCP corpus and without our capacity to regularize spelling and to discover parts of speech. As you can see, the existence of a reliable accessible corpus like the EBO TCP enables that profiling, that articulation of idiosyncrasy and not idi idiosyncrasy. That's one of the staples of literary scholarship. I'm aware that orthographic profile, the profile of an author's spelling may not have any more than technical allure, but we've begun to turn our attention to the much more challenging task of figuring out just where the distinctively archaizing signal in Spencer might most securely be located. I can't do it without Anupam. But I've begun my, mobilizing my own modest computational skills in an attempt to determine where the, what the distinguishing lexical features of Spencer's verse might be. I'm going to skip this illegible spreadsheet. Um, and I'm not going to linger much on this more legible one. Um, across the, the columns are all um, particular um, texts uh, uh, two texts by Spencer, The Shepherd's Calendar and his correspondence with um, Gabriel Harvey, measured against, um, and, and, and this spreadsheet goes um, a quarter of a mile off to the right, um, measured against um, the, the other texts from the same decade. And what we are doing is looking for the most common words in his um, work, the shepherd's calendar, are, are the most idiosyncratic words, not the most common words, but the words that are most distinctive um, when compared to the other works of that same decade. And up at the top is my, then shepherds, followed by her, followed by, and, and <clears throat> you, you would say, well, what's distinctive about 
her? And the answer is that Spencer uses it a great deal more than other texts of his period. What this, what I'm doing is mobilizing a technique called TF-IDF, which is short for term frequency, inverse document frequency. And it's designed to find the lexical signature of a given text using large corpora, all texts, or as in this case, all contemporary verse as a background one. The Shepherd's Calendar is a collection of pastoral poetry, and it's one of the first such collections in English. So it's hardly surprising that shepherds, shepherd, and sheep core, score high in this measure of lexical distinctiveness. But it's a little useful to observe that the highest scoring of the three pastoral keywords is shepherds, not shepherd, which alerts us to Spencer's orientation to community, to what he will refer to in the last book of the Fairy Queen as the shepherd nation. Um, it's nice to see psych, meaning such there on line six, since that's um, an outmoded word, the first distinctive carrier in this list of the archaism, sig archaism signal. Arca sorry, archaism signal. What knocks me out is the pronoun, so that's a topic for a different paper, one that could take time to linger over the fact that the two possessives, my and her, are in predominant position, rather than the archaic um, term hem, which means them, um, further down, and she and me not much lower. The predominance of her turns out to be a fairly big deal. It's a word that one wouldn't notice without the affordances of computational methods. Okay, now it's time for one more acknowledgement. The person speaking in this picture is John Ladd, who finished his PhD a year and a half ago with a dissertation on collaboration and the inferred social network of um, early 17th century English poetry. He's now a postdoc in Martin Mueller's lab at Northwestern. Uh, two summers ago, he gave me a tutorial in Python programming for text analysis, which enabled me to generate the spreadsheets that you were just looking at. Facing him on the right is Keegan, is the hair of Keegan Hughes, um, who studied Spencer with me in the same semester that Kate Needham did. A year and a half later, in the course of a couple of meetings around the table pictured here, Keegan and I discovered what we believed to be the traces of the first draft of the most important poem in Spencer Shepard's calendar. I mention this simply to suggest what can be gained by opening humanities practice to a collaborative lab model. I couldn't have done it without the conversations with Keegan. Here's my point. One can adopt this model as a matter of course design. Um, I teach a regular Spencer course and I teach a lab course in Spencer concurrently. The students in the lab attend the regular course and write about half the papers, but we also meet for an additional hour a week, during which they get a crash course in editorial theory, book history, and XML tagging. In Kate and Keegan's year, we broke them into teams, graduate students assuming leadership responsibilities, and we gave them tasks real tasks that needed to be done for the edition, requiring lots of ingenuity and intelligence. We gave them web design responsibilities, textual work, commentary, the drafting of grant applications and grant reports. Doing so was not my idea. It originated with the Dean of the College, possibly the most brilliant educator I've ever known. It was also possibly the most persuasive person I've ever met. Jim McLeod had recruited me back in 1999 to supervise the implementation of a new set of undergraduate degree requirements. Most of the principles of that curricular reform weren't startling, though I think we implemented them in ways that reflect the peculiar character of Wash U. And I'll spare you some of the details, but one of them is important. We were to make sure that every department implemented a special set of capstone experiences for seniors. Now, I recognize that emphasis on senior projects has been a widespread feature of almost all recent undergraduate curricular reform efforts. But this requirement does have an institution-specific character. For over the years, we'd had extraordinary success in involving undergraduates in the research efforts that are so much a part of our institutional mission. 
That said, most of our success in this vein had been in the biomedical sciences, where we have a long-standing tradition of moving interested undergraduate students swiftly into the lab. Indeed, whenever possible, we move them into labs at the med school. When I began my work on the curriculum, I was convinced that one of the biggest challenges of the task would be learning to keep my mouth shut about the mandate for capstone experiences. Only in the privacy of Jim's office, during one or two of our regular weekly meetings, did I let him know that I thought it was stupid to encourage undergraduates in the humanities to undertake serious research projects. I could get pretty eloquent behind those closed doors on the subject of the inadequacy of their disciplinary preparation, on the excessive stress of immature attempts at independent research, on the cruelty of dooming students to failure or clumsy performance. Maybe the very best majors in any given graduating class could pull something off, I said, but most couldn't. Maybe it would work in the sciences, particularly for students who were part of labs and whose projects might grow out of an environment of shared endeavor, who could hope to take on a piece of a larger project already un well underway and finish that piece, but not in the humanities. Okay, I'm, I, obviously the person who said those things is a jerk. Um, and um, he outgrew his position. As is perfectly obvious, I'm heading towards a punchline. In fact, what I have left to say is nothing more than an ironic anecdotal gloss to what I just reported. I had thought that my objections to undergraduate research in the humanities were at once realistic and compassionate, but they were in fact objections to what I now feel is an inappropriate model for undergraduate research in the humanities. I'd read too many bad undergraduate on your honors theses, theses and was sure that you couldn't send a student of middling talent off to work on an independent project, a project worked up out of a student's own interests, interests frequently quite untethered from the normative concerns and procedural conventions of a discipline. But as I grumbled to the dean, I'd anticipated what I now take to be the remedy, which is for us to rethink at least some pedagogical um, uh, pedagogical practices, sorry, to rethink at least some aspects of training in the humanities. According to the apprenticeship model that has long shaped the best pedagogical practices in the sciences. So let me again put before you my splenetic concession to the successes of the lab as a classroom, this time with feeling. Got it? For students who are part of labs, research projects can grow out of an environment of shared endeavor. Students can hope, on, hope to take on pieces of a larger project already well underway, and they can hope to finish that piece. I'm going to spare you most of the conversion narrative since I want to leave time to evangelize, but I want to report on how this model can be made to work in the humanities. It began when Laura Young, one of my undergraduate advisees asked if I knew of any faculty who needed a research assistant. Uh, Laura was a good student, but not a great one. She'd taken courses in both Shakespeare and Spencer from me, but I really didn't think I had anything that I could entrust to her. Um, and I, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm for time's sake, I'm not going to go through the whole Laura story, but it involved giving her some tasks that I needed to have done. Jim paid her. Uh, then a graduate student um, asked to be trained in, uh, in the reading of um, uh, early um, English handwriting. And uh, uh, I, um, Laura got wind of it. We trained them together. They competed with each other, trained each other and work together on the pro on projects relevant to the edition. Um, so, um, so the proposal that Jim had had um, for me um, uh, that came out of my request for a little funding for um, Laura, who asked um, if I needed a research assistant, uh, he, Jim, in, in fact, said, sure, he would pay her. Um, but then he went on, here's what I'd like to see happen. 
we get a bunch of students together to work on the Spencer project in the summer. We house them for maybe a month. You let them try their hand at what you're doing. In the fall, we require them to take the Spencer course, but instead of papers, they work on the edition. If the work is good, great. If it's not, it doesn't matter. They'll have learned something. And then he stopped and chuckled and said, it doesn't have to be a Spencer course. It doesn't have to be a Spencer course. It can be more like a lab. I humored him. Um, I said, sure, let me think about it. I took his money to pay Laura, but the idea of the lab stuck with me. And a few years later, I decided to float two overlapping courses. A regular three credit upper level Spencer course of the sort I taught um, for years and a four credit course we called the Spencer Lab in which they did most of the work for the regular course or half of the work for the regular course, all the reading and half of the writing. But the rest of the time they devoted to work working on the edition. Um, we broke them into teams. We gave them real tasks requiring ingenuity and intelligence. They wrote grant applications. They revised the grant, uh, uh, one grant application. And one team prepared a couple of ex especially complicated proposals to be put before other editors. The undergraduates wrote, the graduate students edited, work got done, idiosyncrasies were managed, respect abounded, and um, and finally, I'm happy to, uh, to report that we got a grant from the NEH for 450,000, which is peanuts in the sciences, but good for an English professor. I'm a lot more happy about what happened when the semester ended. Three of the undergraduates in the lab course apparently had such a good time that they asked if they could keep working on the edition. And out of nowhere, a freshman showed up. He'd heard about the addition. Could he help? And then another freshman. Even someone with a very rudimentary political sense could see that it would be important to share. And of course, not every student wants to work on Spencer. So we started assembling teams for other projects. We now fund six or seven undergraduates each semester. The costs are actually quite low. We've had a few graduate students as well, and we'll have more as repeated Assurances from the Dean of the Graduate School have slowly convinced departmental DGSs that there are other useful ways for graduate students to earn their fellowships besides serving as TAs and course instructors. Every now and again, when we have the right person, we keep a talented undergraduate like Keegan or Kate on after she or he graduates. We usually fund these post-baccalaureate fellows by putting the bite on the dean of the college. Although together with our colleagues at Northwestern, we've been the recipients of assistance from both Mellon and the ACLS. When Kate had one of these post-bacs, her primary responsibility was to help us enlist undergraduates nationwide to work on the project to improve the accuracy of the EBO tr transcriptions, to enrich their metadata and extend their tagging. The 200 to 25K of the post back is money extremely well spent, and not only because it enables us to keep momentum up on more projects than we, than we could otherwise manage. The post backs often get tasked with speaking to alumni, to parents, and to prospective freshmen, and they make a dazzling impression. A fair amount of work gets done by the fellows during the academic year more when we have a lab course, but we get the greatest amount of work, of work done over the summers when for two months, mixed teams of undergrads and graduate students work half days on one of seven to 10 faculty projects, which have had PIs in recent years from African and African American studies, art history, complete East Asian studies, history, philosophy of science, music, women's studies, several from English and just as many from German. We have weekly progress reports supplemented by technical workshop sessions and discussions of hot issues in DH theory. Two years ago, we enlisted a few librarians to join these teams and it's turned out to be a, turned out to be a terrific means of deepening the cooperation of faculty and library staff. So we have a template now. Interested graduate students and experienced undergraduates not only work on a project, they also manage 
by which I mean teach, the newcomers. In this picture, the seated newcomer, Melanie Moan, took a PhD in English at Princeton and then became a computer programmer. Except when we're under the gun, trying to meet a deadline for a grant application or trying to get materials ready for a research trip, the faculty doesn't so much manage the work as serve as a fountain of means. We have to be able, available to the students, have to look at what they produce and answer their questions, but we seldom need to break problems and tasks down into sequenced components. That's for the students to work out, usually under the rapidly maturing guidance of the advanced undergraduates or graduate students. But expertise is variously distributed. Over the years, we've had graduate students in from other universities, and our undergraduates have done some of their training. We give the students all kinds of tasks, and of course, they turn out to be variously instructive. Um, I've already mentioned student involvement in our first successful application for an NEH grant. It was our third try, I should say. One of the student teams drafted several chunks of the narrative portions of the application. Because they were pitching to the NEH, they had to ask themselves why the general public might be interested in Spencer. Because they had a very sharp sense of what the writing was supposed to accomplish, and because they understood the component tasks and workflow of the project, their prose was quite clear. Because they knew that a late application wouldn't get read, they met deadlines. Because they realized that they couldn't do a credible job alone, they learned to collaborate which is to say that implementing a lab model for humanities research seems to have elicited in our students a sense of professional and intellectual responsibility that I've only seldom been able to elicit in my graduate seminars. And although that may speak to the limits of my abilities as a graduate instructor, I'm sure that it speaks most pointedly to the intrinsic power of the model. Okay, I apologize for the slightly evangelical tone I began my career as something of a pedagogical control freak, incapable of coming into a classroom without an outline. The passages selected and the questions scripted. But a decade of work as a scholarly client has trans transformed my sense of how best to teach our students. I think it quite important to interrogate, at least to interrogate, the relatively recent American orthodoxy in the humanities that it is unfair to impose one's projects and interests on students. I think if we're good at our job, students will learn at least as much from participating in our research, from participating in our research as from reading its results. In fact, my, in my experience, they learn more as participants than as consumers and or as imitators. Big projects. We try to put them on big projects. The early print corpus contains about 60,000 texts, and because the transcriptions aren't perfect, the syntactic analyses and the lemmatizations aren't perfect. So we need to help from the ACLS and Mellon Foundation we recruited students to assist in correcting the corpus. That's what Chelsea Brooks and Jason Dolworth did this summer, along with students from Wash U, Carleton, Knox, and Northwestern. How did we find our volunteers? Kate Needham, Anupam, John Ladd, and I fanned out um, to a number of institutions, taught sessions on book history, on the social network of the book trade, and on the stylistic profiling of texts. With guidance from Frank Grady and money from the ACLS, Jonathan Koch here taught a course here on digital approaches to Tudor and Stuart politics. And that's how we hooked Chelsea and Jason. They not only curated text, but help us refine some of our tools for linguistic search. Okay, I'm not positive of this, but I suspect that at least some of you, even amongst, among the most interested or engaged in DH methods may be inwardly observing that what I'm describing may be feasible for my kind of intellectual project, for editing, say, but not for their kind of scholarly work. I'm hoping that now that we're at the question period, you can, you'll feel free to air that skepticism. I can imagine other doubts, for example, the suspicion that the structures I've described might not work at all institutions. It's not my goal to contest this sort of objection, although I do think that it can be interesting to talk about the fit of models to projects and institutions. I really do think it can be useful for humanists to at least consider ways 
of bringing our research practice, not just our results, out into the pedagogical sunlight. That said, it may be that some of you are already doing this sort of thing, or that if you're not, I've already sold you and you'd like to give it a try. In that case, I've boiled the humanities lab model down to a series of design ma maxims, one set for faculty and another for administrators, and I can share them if you like, though perhaps now would be a good time simply to stop and take questions. But I appreciate your giving me a chance to evangelize a bit. So I'm gonna stop sharing, um, but if you wanna see the, uh, my, the manifesto, the design maxims, I'm happy to bring that up after you've asked what questions you have now. Great, thanks, John, that's fantastic. Let me put my camera back on. I think we have the capacity for folks to raise their hands and I, between Tiffany, Peggy and I, we can scout out who that is and take folks off mute to ask questions verbally. I, I like that idea. Um, also, there's some things coming into the Q&A room here. Laura Westhoff says, yes, please bring up the manifesto. Already, is that the, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, you, want, you want the manifesto? Let's see here. Uh, okay, let me, let me, I need to share the screen again. I need to get back to the presentation. Where is it? Maybe I don't know where it is. Laura, you should be unmuted, oh. are you? Here oh, we go. Great. There I am. Okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, here's the here's the manifesto. Do you want that now, or do you want it later? Sure. I, I actually would like very much to talk to you about and to hear more about how you would think about this kind of project and getting started. So this is why I'm interested in the manifesto. But imagine a poor regional public institution with zero resources other than maybe a couple of endowed faculty who might have a little bit of money. Okay, so um, why don't I do that? Why don't I scoop through the manifesto? Yep. And then right. we'll circle back to this, okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, this is the part for faculty and we'll deal with the administrators later, all right? <laughs> so first of all, you wanna seek opportunities for collaborative work. Um, all possible opportunities for collaboration. And so the first thing you wanna do is to ask yourself, what project, what aspect of what you're doing could you use some help with? Um, and most of us in the humanities are trained to do everything ourselves, but if you scratch your head, you can think of things that someone could take off your desk uh, and do for you. And all those things are opportunities for student education. Um, you should be selfish. That is, don't think about lining up tasks pedagogically line up tasks that you give to people in the order at with, at, in which you need to have them done. Um, the student, that's the way it works in labs. Um, something has to be done, you put a student on it. Something else has to be done. The students don't need things put in order. Um, they, uh, it's more important to them to know that what they're doing is going to be used and to get a sense of how. Uh, I've already made this point. It's important to think in terms of big projects, not, um, not an article you're working on, but a book that you're working on, um, or um, unless it's an article that's tremendously complex. You want to assign crucial tasks, not just, not just the scut work. Um, the stuff like getting a grant application drafted. Um, um, let the students train the students. Don't do it yourself. Um, oh, listening in while they explain things to each other 
um, clarifies what you didn't explain adequately. Um, so letting them train each other um, obviously is um, giving them giving them skills that they wouldn't otherwise have and gives them a new fact, fix on the activities that they're engaged in. Meet weekly, this is really important. Um, if you give them a task and give them plenty of time to do it, um, they may do it wrong. And if they come back to you in a month and they've gone off in the wrong direction and you can't use the work, it's not only useless to you, but they'll gauge it. They'll discover that you're disappointed and they'll be crestfallen. It's important to see, uh, to, to, to look at things once a week and it's also cheerful. Um, I have a colleague who, uh, in Earth and Planetary Science who runs a, um, who's been having students in his lab for, um, I don't know, since before any of us were born. Uh, and he says that he likes to bring students in, into his lab while their brains are still smooth. Um, he wants freshmen, not seniors. He doesn't wait until they're trained. Uh, and I finally realized the point of this. If you, exp if you give someone a task freshman year, by the end of their sophomore year, they understood the whole thing. Um, if you train someone in the senior year, they're gone in a they're gone in a year, and you have to train somebody else. So the freshman and the sophomore is a much more valuable resource than um, than the senior. And you, but you want to aim for a mixed team, and that's of course obvious. Um, people of different skill levels, um, different with people with different backgrounds. It's the stuff that the folks in management have been telling us all along. The more heterogeneous the, um, the team, the more productive. Um, so that's it. Now you asked a question, it was Laura, right? Yes. Um, so you asked a question about how to do this on the cheap. Um, well, I mean, first of all, if you were working with a team of three students, and it, uh, it's possible that uh, that things are so tight that a dean couldn't pay them um, ten bucks an hour to do four to six hours a week over a semester. But it turns out that those are not big sums, and students are elated. For, to have those kinds of opportunities. If, um, if you do it as part of a lab course, then you're not paying anything. Um, you're paying in course credit. Um, you have to believe that you're giving them an honest education by having them work on your stuff. And it takes for some of us a kind of rethinking of, um, of the barrier that we've erected between research and teaching. But we should be capable of doing that rethinking. Does that start to scratch away at the cost problem? Um, it, it does. It, it, I, I, you know, we're at a, it, it, we've just gone through a round of budget cuts where we don't have any money to pay students. Um, okay, so, or, but you can so offer think, a course. You can yeah, offer a lab course. Sure, sure. Um, it's yeah. It's cost free. The only thing you have to do is convince your department chair that that's a real course in your field. Well, I am the department chair, so and it's done. that's a pretty easy sell. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, we, we have a number of digital history projects um, that have floated around our history department and, and colleagues who have done this really quite um, extensively already and have been doing lab models for, tw for, you know, 15, 20 years. The question really is how do we get to the kind of DH project that you've presented us with? And it sounds like from your model that that needs some fairly significant investment investment up front to get to a point where you can apply for the kinds of grants that that you were able to secure which 
seems critical to really launching these kinds yeah. of projects. So we started with one assistant director of the Humanities Digital Workshop. Um, and she had skills that pretty much, that, that were adequate to the then extant projects. And then after about two or three years, when the faculty was sort of getting excited about what was happening, um, we added another person. Um, we may add a third, but we've been going for, you know, 12 years, I guess. Um, we're, about, we're probably going to add a third. Um, libraries often come up with those people. Sometimes they can't. Um, uh, we, we steal that, those salaries from the academic computing budget. Um, they're not huge, those salaries. We seem to be able to support this kind of stuff with right now with two staff. And I'm talking about keeping a dozen projects going. Um, so. That's interesting. Now, That's Joe, as, as the associate dean, I've taken a couple notes here. And I think the dean was on. But I want to move us along, if that's OK. We have two or three more questions. Sure. If we have some time here. I know uh, Ving has a question. And Tiffany's going to let people come forward and unmute them here. Hello, uh, Mr. Joseph. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, this has been a really, really interesting class. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a crossroad here. So I, I want to know what is our end game here for the whole project for receiving the grant? And um, so we're working towards something. Uh, we're seeing the frequency of how language change and grow over time, English. Um, but um, at the end of the day, do we do we only do our research on English only, or do we will we see will we see how English refer to other language being referred by other language? Grow or be affected by the language um, in this project. That's well, all uh, the question I have. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Um, for early print, um, we're we started we started working with this stuff because Anupam wanted to answer some questions for a project he was working on, and he listened and he wanted to help me answer. The questions that I was working on. And then we mocked up some search tools that would make it useful for other scholars in our field. Uh, then we teamed up with Martin Mueller, who was really trying to take this EBO TCB corpus that was being sustained by ProQuest with extra donations from R1 research libraries. And um, now we have a editorial board and we basically spend a certain amount of time asking scholars who are interested in corpus level inquiry what tools they would like. So on the one hand, we're trying to feed our own research needs. And then we've started trying to feed other people's research needs as a way of figuring out what kind of general purpose tools the community might want to use. And so far, ACLS and Mellon have, have liked that. Um, uh, we're at a bit of a crossroads because, in fact, our shop does not have production um, uh, programmers. Uh, you know, the people who build things that um, will stay up and running 24 seven. So we're, um, in order to have something that others can use and that won't break in the middle of the night, that's, that's going to be a big step for us. But I think that the goal is um, to 
enable people who study this literature, both you know undergraduates as well as research scholars, to make better sense of it. We now have a tool that kind of works like Netflix, if you like X, um, or what's the text that is most like it in the corpus? What are the four texts that are most like it in the corpus, according to these, this or that criteria? So the goal there is for the researcher to discover um, work relevant to her research that she didn't recognize might be relevant for research. Is that kind of answering the question? Okay. Well, we muted, we muted uh, them, but can I pig piggyback on that? In terms of expanding this to other languages, is there work like this being done internationally in different locations? And what would it take for that to kind of be facilitated? There is indeed. Um, uh, the, um, and in fact, the linguistic search tools that we've put up on early print um, uh, are built on a, um, on a linguistic corpus uh, query tool that was developed in the Netherlands and is language agnostic. Um, uh, there are a number of linguistic uh, centers of linguistic research that do corpus linguistic stuff and we're frequently stealing their, uh, stealing their tools. Um, I have to say that, um, uh, well, no, I think that, I, I think that's, that's enough. I, I'm not a comparative linguist. Um, and so um, I, I haven't assumed it was my responsibility to, um, I mean, what we're doing is really stealing other people's tools for the purposes of enabling scholars of early English print culture to, and literary culture and history to um, get at the corpus of printed stuff. Um, Great, okay. We have two more questions. One's from Frank Grady. We're gonna save that one for last because I know that's gonna be a, a very challenging one. Oh dear. I know we're just about out of time. I'm looking yeah, at yeah, my Yeah, you're breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> I think Taylor Weintraub had a question. Yes, hi. So I was wondering for us students that are wanting to become more involved in these sort of interdisciplinary lab studies, how, are, how would you recommend us going about finding these other researchers interested in, interested in similar topics or finding labs um, in need of participants? Uh, speaking for myself, I'm in my final semester of undergrad and I do plan on going to graduate school. One big focus I have is trying to create more interdisciplinary work between the humanities and other disciplines. I think it's extremely necessary and especially for creating a next generation of great thinkers, we need to not compartmentalize so, so much as we see in college campuses sometimes. And uh, I think it's just a big curiosity I have of how do we go about trying to get involved in these sorts of studies? Yeah. Um, Taylor, what's your area of research? Uh, what's your major? Well, I'm an English major and I'm a political science minor. And when I go to graduate school, one big area of study I really wanted to do is sort of dive into, I, I, I'm, I'm really into two big areas. I like linguistics and then I like composition and rhetoric stuff. But what my ultimate goal is to try to propose a new way to go about studying or um, teaching English studies at the secondary level, because I do not agree with the format of how it is taught in our high schools and middle schools. I think it is incredibly reductive. It is not okay. beneficial to people on either side of your math or English. So that's kind of my overarching goal, I suppose. But I'm, I'm an English student, political science minor, and I'm very in depth of the world of literature, grammar, linguistics, all of that good stuff. So Taylor, my first recommendation is that you make an appointment to talk to Professor Grady, who is liable to know who in the department would be um, interested in having a research assistant. Or um, uh, if, if we get, I'm hoping that we're going to get funding for another uh, summer workshop for which we can bring in external students. We did it for the first time. It's not clear that we'll be able to get funding for non-WashU students, but if we 
did, you'd be more than welcome to work on this project if it seemed mm -hmm. attractive to you. Um, but um, the, the thing to do is to start asking the department chair in your, um, in your, in your majors, um, and he or she is most likely to know um, how to steer you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. So I, we, yeah, we, have, we have one more question here. I'm, I apologize. Our time is tight. And thank you so much for running over a little bit here. I'm sure people could reach out to you via email if they want. Um, I, I can't wait to see what Frank says. I'm on the edge of my seat here. Hello, Frank. Hi, Joe. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Um, I'm uh, completely convinced by your account of the way in which um, this kind of uh, work can, can by itself generate questions that we would not have thought to ask before. And, uh, you know, and, and, and projects that can take us in new directions. Um, but I, I lack the kind of imagination to do that. So I'm going to ask you a particular question about Spencer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Would it be right to say that the conclusion to draw from the work that you've started to do on his archaizing is not that it was less visible to his contemporaries than it has been to us who have been comparing his work to an impoverished corpus of canonical texts, but rather that its essential devices are confined to a narrower range than we might have traditionally assumed? Or is there yet another conclusion that you think that that work is gonna, is gonna take you to? Like that Spencer wasn't an archaizer at all, and we've been wrong for several hundred years? No. Um, I think Spencer was an archaizer. I think we can make the word list and the um, morphological list of the features of um, certain of his texts, the Shepherd's Calendar, the, um, the Fairy Queen, Colin Clouds Come Home Again, um, that um, that send the archaizing signal. Um, the editorial principle that um, that one needs to preserve his spelling is bonkers. Um, it turns out that there's nothing weird about his spelling. It's word choice and um, and morphology. Um, at, not even uh, not even word order. Nothing weird about it. Um, I think we can actually go further. We can sort of um, now we've got a picture of which medieval authors are exerting the gravitational pull. Um, I, I think I think we can do that. Um, the editorial point is we shouldn't we should not be met, we, we should go ahead and modernize the spelling. Um, I've lost that battle. That's not going to happen. Um, but I think we there's a case to be made, and that's kind of. It. Can I go back to the other business of the, the you're not having the imagination to um, uh, figure out how you might implement it in your own? Yeah, I don't have any money either. Yeah. So, you know, if Taylor, you be prepared you, for a disappointing interview. Yeah, so if you decided that you wanted to implement some research lab courses and um, uh, uh, those don't cost anything. You weren't paying for um, RA ships. If you decide you wanted to do that and you wanted to see if you could come up um, with three faculty members whose research was amenable to conversion to collaborative work, um, the business, it, I, it, I, I can say to you that it's a much heavier lift to get faculty to imagine talking with other people about their work before they know what they think about it. Mm -hmm. um, that's the heaviest lift. Um, everything else falls into place. Um, and I don't think money is the, I don't think money is the constraint. I think it has to do with our uh, imaginings of what should happen in a classroom. But that's, I mean, I know that's arguable, but that's my strong position. Frank, I'm wondering if we could work out something where we look at minority mental health and um, notions of it being publicly 
note it in some capacity. I don't know. Bring psychology in with the, with English and, and maybe history as well. So there's an example of, of someone being willing to talk about a project before it has advanced. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> no, I love the idea. I mean, both both for the both for the both for the example and for the forward looking suggestion. So this is great. Well, I wish we had more time here, but uh, I, I, I know this has been a wonderful hour. Thank you so much. You, you've really kicked us off here to a brilliant start. Um, I'm, I'm tickled to death. This couldn't have gone any better. Um, and I just really want to say thank you so much to all of our attendees, uh, to Dr. Lowenstein. It's been fantastic. Uh, Tiffany and, and Peggy have been blowing me up behind the scenes here, helping keep things organized. So thank you to the both of you. And um, I guess we will just shut it down at this point. Thank you very much. Everybody be well, take care, and thank you for attending. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Bye.